Welcome to the Summit Properties Podcast. Um, it is January 31st, 2019, and today I'm sitting with Evan Small, a Las Vegas real estate broker. Uh, good morning, Evans. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Good, thank you. Uh, today, Evans, we're going to talk about the real estate prices in Las Vegas, and I understand that you've compiled some data that shows some pretty interesting figures, uh, but just in general, let's let's get into this. What... Uh, what is going on out there? I understand pricing has uh, almost become out of control. Um, well, pricing is always is always a huge issue in the real estate industry. We've had a seller's market uh, for the last two years where in the past two years, the median price has risen 26%. So sellers have gotten used to just adding five, dollars $7,000 to whatever sold in the last month or two and expecting to get multiple offers close to that. What they don't understand is our sales numbers are plummeting. Uh, down 19% in December, and they'll probably be down 19 to 20% this month, January 2019. And that is sending a signal that they're missing. The signal is we don't want to buy at that price. We're willing to wait. We're willing to shop around and make sure it's the perfect home, and then we'll put in an offer. How much of this is um, maybe all the buyers that were out there unqualified have already bought? Um, very likely uh, that's not true. Um, we still have an influx of people. Our population is growing. Our construction jobs are absolutely huge right now. Um, not 2006 or seven numbers, of course, but they've probably doubled in the last three or four years. Probably have 65 to 70,000 construction workers. We're bringing in new industry. So the economy is strong. There is pent up demand, but as I've said before, it's a combination of sellers asking a little too much and buyers being confronted with sticker shock because they remember the prices from two years ago and think it still applies today. And I know you use data, uh, as we've talked about, um, to you know, take, have actionable insights and, and some of the strategies you deploy for your clients, both on the buying and the selling side. Um, in our talks briefly this morning, I, I heard you found some pretty interesting data in terms of how many people um, are actually, you know, reducing their offers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, uh, I've tracked the multiple listing service, new listings and price reductions. And for each week recently, we've seen that the numbers are about the same. So we add 750 new listings, but we have 735 or so price reductions. So people are going in overly optimistic, and realtors are not doing a good job in really forcing people to look at the price issue. And it's taken, they might be on the market 60 to 90 days before it dawns on them that we really are overpriced. And that's when a lot of interest is lost in a house. People wonder what's wrong with it. It's been on the market for 90 days. This one sold in 30. This one sold in 15. This one got offers in 10. And it's just because the agent did not let people know how critical it is to price it right the first time because that's when the most interest in a property is found is in the first week or two of a listing. And how do you work with your with your agents in terms of um, explaining to them the importance of getting that, that pricing stuff right? Oh, all of my agents know that. It's the clients, and we have to respect them. Everybody is emotionally attached to their home. So when they need, see that their neighbor's home sold at 340 say, they know their house is at least $30,000 better than that because it's their house. They haven't done anything different from what the other owners did, but they know that because they were in it, they took better care of it. It has a better location. It's on the same street, but it's a better location on that street. Uh, their yard is much nicer. Um, they've maintained the home better, and they don't realize that buyers don't look at it that way. Buyers are looking, what did the neighbor's house sell for? That's what I'm willing to pay. What are some of the strategies you use to set those expectations properly with, uh, with new listings? Well, I will list a property at the seller's requested price 
and say, let's look at how many showings we have in the first two weeks. If we don't have any showings, that's a clear indication that you're overpriced. And then we will revisit the uh, position of the home in the market, which is called looking at the price. Um, it sounds much better as we, if I tell them we're just going to reposition, then we're going to lower your price. But we reposition the home after a couple of weeks. Still no, and frequently, we're still a little high, but we're a lot closer to where we should be. Now, I do have one client right now who is a Southern California realtor. And she is just convinced that even though she's 12% too high on her price, we've had no offers in two months, and we're getting several walkthroughs, she doesn't understand that she is selling other people's properties because they'll see hers at a high price, see a larger home with better feature at a lower price, buy that home. Hers stays on the market. Realtors are happy to show it because then they'll show a house right afterwards that's a much better value. She should know that as a real estate professional, but because it's her house and she's an expert in Southern California, she is keeping her price artificially high here. I know you touched on it earlier, but if a home was kind of like, you know, like a movie, you have a premiere and then it's all kind of downhill from there. I mean, how does that impact the listing? It, people wonder why a house is still on the market. Um, when there are five or six homes available that have been on the market for 30 days or less, and they see one that's been on the home, uh, market for 120, they wonder why. And so they go in with a more negative approach. There's got to be something wrong with this house. I just have to find out what it is. Because the rest of these houses are still fresh. But this one is now stale. It's like a piece of produce. Um, you, you go in and you look at a lemon and it's nice and fresh. But after a month or so, um, it's not going to look the same. And that's kind of the approach buyers have when they look at a house is it's been on the market for 90 days. All I have to do is find out what's wrong with it, not why to buy it. For new listing clients, what advice would you have in terms of, of uh, you know, hey, trust me, we use comparables, we use comps, we use sophisticated systems to determine the value. We don't care that you put the paver stones in the backyard with your own two hands and you did all this amazing work and you think it's worth 60000 extra dollars. Trust us as the professionals. We have the right tools. How do you convey that? Or what advice would you have for a seller to just say, guys, look, we're not, you know, I think a general assumption in the market, I would just have to guess, is that they think, well, the realtor is just interested in making a commission. They're just going to churn and burn and get this thing sold as quick as they can. They're not going to get us the right price. I don't believe as, as prof now, now you're in a whole other tier in terms of, of terms of caliber and quality of work. But I don't think the top good real estate firms like, like Summit Properties and the others, I don't believe that that's the case. I think you're going to get as much as you can um, when selling the home, but you know that threshold. So how do, how do you convey that to, to people looking to list their homes with you? You're asking me, how do you use logic to overcome emotion? And that's something maybe a counselor could do, a social worker, something like that. Realtors were ill-prepared for that. We stand on facts, and I don't know how to deal with fantasy. Um, I do my best to, I will even give you what's known as a comparative market analysis, where I compare feature by feature, where we've added value to your house because it's better than the one next door, or where we've deducted because it doesn't have a certain feature. I've got it down to where I read appraisals, and I know what's a $3,000 upgrade, what's a $5,000 upgrade, what's a $10,000 upgrade. I can put together a 15-page report comparing to six comps, and the seller doesn't care. His house is still worth 30000 more because it's his house. So again, you list it at that price for two weeks, and you try to get them to agree. If there's no activity at all in two weeks, we reduce at least half of the amount you know they're overpriced. Wow. So it really is this crazy emotional thing that's probably ending up hurting people. It's the biggest asset that most people have ever had. So they want the most for it that they can possibly get. 
and they don't understand the reality of numbers because, again, it's, it's emotion. So you understand that selling between three forty thousand and three fifty thousand is ten thousand dollars more in their pocket. So you're willing to try it, but you can't live in a fantasy world. If it's not working, then that ten thousand dollars will never exist. I used to use the line, "Well, heck, it should be at three twenty. You want to list at three forty? Why don't we just list at four fifty? You're not going to get that either, but at least you can tell people you're selling a $450,000 home. You'll never see it, but let's give it a shot. I mean, that's pretty much what they're doing. It's like they're coming to you and like any other profession, you go to your doctor or lawyer, they're saying, don't do that. You're sticking your hand in a fire. Why can't realtors get the same respect? Well, the amazing thing is you'll go to a doctor or a dentist and never ask them what it's going to cost. You'll just assume you're going to get charged what it's going to be. Now, they're the experts in their field. They have a rate structure. They follow that rate structure. We are the experts in our field. It's not like a used car lot where we've got 17 Mavericks, a Pinto, and a Chevy Vega, and we're trying to tell you they're all worth such and such amount of money. We are comparing apples to as close a comparison to a similar apple as possible and letting you know this is the reality of today's market. Now, when the market was going up, I was telling sellers, let's add 7,000. This one closed at 355. Let's go 362.5. Nice. And we get 360. Nice. Everyone's happy. That market doesn't apply anymore. So now I'm telling them, well, they got 355. Let's list at 356. Well, no, no, I've got to list at 370. Why? It's, you're not going to get it. How, how serious are those sellers? Oh, they're dead serious. They want to sell. I mean, I do not deal with people who are not motivated to sell. Hmm. That's a waste of time. Don't worry. I can wait for it. Well, I don't want to be the person waiting with you. You can find <laughs> someone else. I mean, my yeah. time is valuable. Yes. And I can't have you calling every week to f- find out why your overpriced listing isn't getting any activity. I know why. I told you why when we were in the meeting. So I don't take those. I just had one very unrealistic um, seller uh, advised a value of about 252, and they found one on Zillow across the street that was at 280. They wanted the list at 280. I declined. We left. I'm fine. That $280,000 house, a nice model match, so they're right in looking, hadn't sold in 120 days. Wow. So... Their house was beat up renter. Uh, We've had tenants in it for seven years. The other house was a flip. Brand new uh, appliances, beautiful paint, nice granite countertops, backsplashes, beautiful showers now. And you're telling me at 252, we were going to be lucky to get that. That was my maximum price. I told them they'd probably get 245. But when they see that 273, 280 across the street, they need that. All of a sudden, that's their comp. So I've had their realtor call me twice now because I still manage the renter. And she goes, how did you deal with these people? I said, well, that's why you have the listing and I don't. (laughs) Nice. So you avoid situations like that. You have to. Your time is valuable. And as I say, I'm based in reality. But I do want the seller to get as much money as possible. So I don't underprice a home telling them we're going to get multiple, uh, multiple offers and they'll bid the price up. That, to me, has never worked. We get one offer at the low price and it goes nowhere. So I want you at a good market price to get you the best price possible. It would seem to me that they're pricing a little low and getting multiple offers would probably yield a higher, consistently a higher uh, positive outcome than, than the latter. It depends on where you are in the market. At the low end, you might get away with it. Let's say you're in a $450,000 price range. Not many buyers in that price range. So if you're underpriced and the only guy who wants your home puts in an offer at that price, you're stuck because you told him you'd take that offer. But if you're at 230 price range and you put in at 220, 
and then you might get seven or eight offers and someone will bid up over the 230 that you would have uh, probably listed at to begin with. But even at the lower end, if you're properly priced, you're going to get multiple offers. They may not be over the price that you list at, but you're going to find one whose financing is much more solid and the overall uh, offer is much better than the others. So this is really about um, trusting your realtor, that you're going to hit that sweet spot, that you know what you're doing. Yeah, and, and the sad part is nationwide our reputation is about that of car salesmen, attorneys. I don't think we're down to senators and, and congressmen yet, but, you know, we're not much above that. But we really do, the good ones, we really study the market. We know the market, and we have a good feel about how your home will sell on the market. I'm, I've learned a lot this morning, Evans. Thank you so much. Is there anything else we could talk about in terms of pricing? Are there tips you have? For well, let's save that for the next podcast. Okay. Because there are several good tips to help bring the most value to your property. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Floyd. It's always a pleasure.